good afternoon we welcome you all to our today's webinar on impact of recent supreme court rulings on charitable trusts and partnership firms the bengal chamber of commerce and industry is organizing today's webinar in association with dhruva advisors the bengal chamber by its legacy is an institution with significant contribution to taxation and fiscal matters in its and is continuously providing the forum for tax awareness and tax advocacy the supreme court of india has recently pronounced few landmark judgments in the context of taxation of charitable institutions these judgments provide significant insights on the key tax framework of charitable institutions and the activities which could qualify as a charitable purpose for tax exemptions in case of partnership firms the supreme court has also pronounced a ruling whereby revaluation of assets are taxable in the hands of partners today's deliberations from the distinguished speakers from pro advisors will cover the analysis of the above rulings of the supreme court and its impact we have with us very distinguished speakers from who are as advisors mr aditya hans partner mr shorab shah principal and mr basant godhain principal from dhruva advisor llp with this uh, i wish all the best i now request aditya to take the sessions forward over to aditya thank you thank you arnab uh, well uh, i will say that i i was very impressed that uh, you spoke like someone who knows this subject uh, thank you thank you for giving us uh, and thanks to bcci thanks to you thanks to sarvani thanks to all of you for giving us this opportunity where uh, we will be able to present to the audience a very very interesting topic something which is you know i'll say in the field of charitable institutions at least and partnership firms partnership firms well the law has evolved but in case of charitable trust or any form of charitable institutions it is a disruptive ruling and disruptive to the extent that in one of the rulings the supreme court also realized that if this is going to be the ruling for the past few years what kind of a chaos it will create for most of these charitable institutions so it's said that although it should apply pros- retrospectively this would actually in this case not to create a chaos would apply prospectively and these are very disruptive rulings in today's uh, tax fraternity and uh, as, and not being discussed is actually a crime so we took the opportunity of uh, attending to this rulings for the audience So to start with, we'll first be discussing the charitable, uh, the taxability around charitable trust. What does the two Supreme Court rulings on charitable trust speak about? What disruption have they brought about? And uh, at closing level, we'll also try to give you some uh, direction that what should uh, charitable institution, what should checks and balances should they should start building on? Now to set the tone right. if i look at charitable institutions they have played a very significant role in sharing government responsibility it's actually uh, you know charity is a government responsibility but these institutions which have been funded by privately or through different uh, sources have actually shared the responsibility of the government for providing services to underprivileged and for the development of the welfare of the country in order to encourage such charitable trust and organizations various reliefs including exemption from tax has been provided it is interesting to note that from ay 1415 to ay 1718 the amount of exemption sought has increased from 2.6 trillion to 6.9 trillion this is basis a 2022 latest data which was uh, published it's past historical data but just imagine if something in financial year 16 17 was around 7 trillion rupees we would it be standing today and this clearly demonstrates a exponential increase in charitable activities in the country along with advancing the noble cause of charity it is also essential to guard 
against abuse of these exemption clauses, as at times many organizations under the disguise of charity do commercial activities, earn abnormal profits and claim exemption they of all under the garb and purview of charity. It is for this reason that the new provisions were introduced in 2021 and with further amendments in 2022. So government has been cleaning this up, but <clears throat> this is something of the past which is carrying, coming. Not only the parliament, but also the Supreme Court have time and again interpreted the provisions in relation to charity. In this regard, I would like to highlight the matter of legal interpretation in the context of charitable institutions. It's not only been dealt by division benches, but also by larger benches of the Supreme Court. You can understand how critical these matters are. And these have been, <clears throat> even the recent decision which I'm going to talk, we are going to discuss today, is from the larger bench of the Supreme Court, that is three judge bench issue. The Apex Court has announced two landmark judgments, which going to, we are going to discuss today. Interestingly, both on 19th October 2022, giving two different, talking about two different principles, but on the same date. One in the context of charitable institutions engaged in advancement of general public utility dealing with section two, subsection 15 of the act. This has been dealt in the Ahmedabad Urban Development Authority ruling by the Supreme Court. And another one in the case of educational institutions, Deal, which has been, which is dealing with section 1023C, uh, clause 6, which has been dealt in the new noble education society ruling of the Supreme Court. The Apex Court decision will have broad repercussion in the context of charity in India and related regulations, as these decisions have unsettled what was already settled. Interestingly, they were settled, you know, these positions were settled by earlier Supreme Court rulings. Now, this Supreme Court ruling overrules those Supreme Court rulings. Obviously, they have tried to distinguish to the extent it looks practical that those rulings were in, a, in the context of an earlier law. This ruling is in the context of the current law. So they have tried to distinguish. But was that distinguished required? Actually, there was a distinguishment or not? I don't know. We'll discuss that. For example, educational institutions run on different kinds of models. While some are fully funded by the state, some are operated for the purpose of ensuring parity and providing education for all with primarily charitable motive and incidental ancillary activities. Incidental ancillary activities by private. This incidental word is going to be very critical, which we'll see in the subsequent discussion. By private people and some working predominantly under some business model with a profit motive. In most cases, education institutions operating for pro providing education for all with primary objective, along with certain incidental ancillary activities function, mostly as trust and claim exemption under the Income Tax Act. Prior to the recent ruling of the Supreme Court, the prevailing legal jurisprudence mainly involved identification of the predominant, the primary object of a trust. And if an institution predominantly existed for charitable purposes, it would avail unfettered exemption under Section 11 or 1023C. The Apex Court in an earlier ruling had held that mere fact that substantial surpluses are there profits were being generated. This could not be a reason for rejecting an approval under 1023C Clause 6 of the Act. But things, things have evolved post this ruling. Further, in another ruling, it was also held the society or trust may not directly run the school imparting education. Instead, it may be instrumental in setting up schools or colleges imparting education as long as the sole object of the society or trust is to impart education. The fact that it does not do so itself but its colleagues or schools do so, does not result in rejection of its claim. Now the Apex Court in his ruling in New Noble Education Society strictly followed the rules of literal interpretation and has held that taxing statutes are to be constructed in terms of the plain language. Following that doctrine, in its strictest form, the Honorable Supreme Court has laid emphasis on the term solely, so as to imply and mean that charitable institutions, society or trust is required to engage itself in education or educational activities and not engage in any profit, implying that such institutions cannot have objects that are unrelated to education. Practically, this is theoretical, but practically how much it is possible, it's, it, you go, if you look at the ground reality, it's very difficult to implement something like that. The court, in order to further clarify, has held when institutions provide their premises or infrastructure to other entities, trusts, societies, for the purpose of conducting workshops, seminars, or even educational sources, courses, which the concerned trust is not actually imparting, and outsiders are permitted to enroll in seminars, workshops, courses, 
then the income derived from such activity cannot be characterized as part of educational or incidental to the imparting of education. Such income can properly fall under the head other income and this could lead to denial of the exemption as a whole as well. In the same manner, if a school or educational institution run their own buses, provide bus facilities, transport to, to transport children, running hostels, canteens, cafeterias, for students of other schools, such facilities cannot, can't be considered incidental or educational activities, incidental to the education. However, when institutions provide hostel, allied facilities, catering only to its students, that activity, activity would be clearly be incidental to the objective of imparting education. These clarity, this was not there in the past, this is all coming from the rules. These clarification would require a significant change in the object of the educational institutions post this ruling. You know, this is something most of the educational institutions have to revisit. The court realizing the fact that since these judgments depart from various previous rulings regarding to meaning the term solely, in order to avoid disruption and to give, as I told in earlier also, and to give time to institutions likely to be affected to make appropriate changes and adjustments had clarified that the present judgment shall operate prospectively. Even though the amendment happened many years back, but this will apply. I find it a little hard to believe. Well, I think so they'll apply prospectively to the revenue authorities. Now, another example would be say, statutory corporations, authorities, or bodies engaged in housing development, supply of water, sewage management, supply of food grain, institution tasked with exclusive duties of prescribing curriculum, disciplining professionals and prescribing standards of professional conduct. The ICAI, ICWAI, ICSI were considered to be involved in the advancement of objectives, objects of the GPU, general public utility, and therefore considered charities in GPU categories. But now the Supreme Court, by its ruling in case of Ahmedabad Urban Development Authority, has laid down certain determinative tests for statutory bodies to qualify as GPU charities. The Supreme Court has held if the activities such as housing, supply of water, etc., are actually carried out for the advancement of the objects of the GPU, even though they are in the nature of trade, commerce, or business, it does not bar the institution from tax exemption. If the consideration is charged on a cost basis, it can't be considered for business. So, uh, so the test for uh, you know falling in in trade commerce and uh, trade and commerce is that if it is at a cost then you are out of that bucket in case the consideration charge is significantly higher than the cost the receipts would indicate that the activities are in fact trade commerce or business as a result it is required to comply with the threshold limit defined in the respective provision that is 20 percent as provided in section 2 subsection 15. This decision will incentivize the tax department to undertake detailed and regular scrutiny of all active, all charitable organizations who have got themselves registered under the category GPU. So uh, I know this question would also come, but this also get covered for the other categories because GPU is like a residuary category. What about the primary categories, the per se categories? So will this principle apply there also? Uh, well, I think so, no, but you never know how, how the revenue may take it up now. They, they can definitely draw some analogy of profit, less profit, no profit, because this was never dealt about the quantum of profits, which anyone will learn, will judge whether it is charitable or not. That was never a test, but that has been put to, that has been, you know, that Supreme Court by default has put that as a test. Will that be applied for the other categories? The revenue can, but I feel then you have a good case. Having said the context and discussing the background of Charity India, I now hand over the baton to my colleague Saurabh, who will take you to the uh, provisions, the rulings, everything in thread. Saurabh, over to you. Sure. Thanks, uh, thanks Aditya. And uh, good afternoon to all the participants on this uh, webinar. So, so as Aditya rightly mentioned in the beginning that, you know, these Supreme Court decisions, I think they have created a disruption. And, and like he said, you know, they have unsettled many settled positions, which, which all of us at one point of time would have now felt that they are now done and dusted. And, and personally, uh, to me, I think these judgments are no less than a finance bill where, you know, the existing law itself is rewritten to a very significant extent. And, and having said that, with all you know, due respect, the judgments 
according to me, do provide clarity on many of the aspects. But but as we will discuss, I think there are a lot of open questions. And, and even the industry and the tax professionals, I think we are still grappling to find the correct answers. So, so what we will do is that, you know, over the next 30, 40 minutes or so, we will try and, you know, explain the intricacies and nuances by way of some practical real life examples so that we can, you know, better appreciate the issues which are emerging and we will brainstorm as we move along. So, so that is how we wanted to attempt uh, this session. And, and, and if you have any questions, I think please feel free to post it in the Q&A box and, and we will uh, address all your questions towards the uh, end of the session. Okay. So, so this is the agenda which we briefly wanted to cover where we will first just to set the context we will talk about the basic architecture of the charitable trust and how it has been taxed thus far then we will discuss some of the key principles which are em emerging from these two supreme court decisions and and th then like i said you know we have various case studies explaining you know real life situations and and how does the supreme court decisions impact each of the case study is something we will see as we move along and and then definitely what next and what is the way forward for uh, ngos for charity for mncs who have various csr entities i think that is something which we will discuss as we move along okay so so as a background and just to set the context, I think all of us know that a charitable activity under the Income Tax Act is broadly characterized into six different buckets. Okay, so whether a activity qualifies as a charitable purpose or not, I think you need to satisfy the definition which is laid down in 215. And what the definition basically provides is that if you are activity is something which is providing a relief to poor or is it pertaining to education, or to yoga, medical relief, or preservation of environment or monuments. These are called as charitable activities and the Income Tax Act is restricted to these activities being qualified as charitable activities. However, there is even a residuary category in the Income Tax Act which says that if you are engaged in an activity which is advancing any other general public utility, that can also be regarded as a charitable purpose. Okay, and the only question over here is that the residuary category or the GPU as we will, as the Supreme Court has said, and you know how we will also be referring to for GPU activity, there is a carve out to say that even if you are doing any business activity, then that business activity is permissible so long as it is incidental to the GPU activity and the revenues from the business activity do not exceed 20% of the total revenue. So this is what is provided under the act as to the broad framework or the broad architecture of a charitable activity. So before we move on to what exactly the Supreme Court has said, uh, just a brief re recap on you know what the law stood thus far before the Supreme Court decisions came into. I think all of us know that you know there are several Supreme Court judgments which Aditya also mentioned that you know there are Supreme Court decisions which have said that in order to qualify whether an activity is a charitable or not, you need to look at the predominant objective. And, and we have Supreme Court, umpteen number of Supreme Court cases which have said that as long as my predominant objective is charitable in nature, the mere fact that I may do some other activity which could be a business activity, which could be something which is non-charitable, but as long as my dominant objective is charitable in nature, the entity or the trust should be regarded as a charitable trust and there should not be any questions raised on the tax exemption. That was something which is laid down by Supreme Court in various, various uh, decisions. The second test, what we know is, and which even the Supreme Court has said that, as long as I have any business activities, and let's say those business activities are incidental to carrying on my charitable activities, then they are also permitted. And, and, and as we discussed for the GPO category, that, that has to be a 80-20 threshold. But as far as the other primary or the per se categories are concerned, there is no threshold about 20%, 80% which is provided in the law. It is only for the GPO categories. Third and very important test which, which was being laid down prior to the Supreme Court decisions was that even if I am earning, let's say, exorbitant profits or if I am earning super normal profits, as long as those profits are getting redeployed in my charitable institution, then my eligibility to claim exemption is not jeopardized. Let's say I'm running a hospital and let's say the hospital is making sizable profits on a year-on-year -year basis. 
but those profits let's say are not taken away by the trustees they are not siphoned off they are reinvested into the hospital itself or for building some other hospital so so if such is the fact pattern you know the supreme court in queens education society uh, and and many other rulings had said that as long as the profits are redeployed the eligibility to claim exemption is not jeopardized and 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 of course like we said that i can have a incidental business activity which will actually feed my charitable activity so for example let's say i am running a educational institution and 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 let's say i am running a educational institution in a metro city and even in a backward area let's say the educational institution in a metro city is earning profits and those profits are actually used to subsidize the institution which i am running in a backward area then that is something which is permissible so this these are the broad principles which we knew thus far and now you know as we move along what what we will see is that the supreme court has actually rewritten and expounded the law pertaining to taxation of charities and how exactly it will impact us and and you know what are the situations which one really needs to be mindful of i think that is something which we will uh, discuss in the form of case studies okay okay so so this slide basically talks about what are the key principles emerging from the supreme court decisions so what i will do is that we will come to this slide at the end of the session once we have gone through the case studies so that we can better relate to what has been discussed in this slides so i think directly we can go to case studies okay just one second okay so so this case study i think is on uh, on a institution a school in this example which has multiple objects so let's say i am a school and let's say my my activities are broadly divided into three categories one of course is running of the school itself second let's say i have a yoga center in the nearby vicinity of the school and third you know which is not uncommon i think all of us might know that you know various schools i think they uh, rent out their playgrounds or halls for various social functions like marriages etc so so this is the fact pattern what we have and and as and as far as bifurcation of my total revenues are concerned let's assume that you know as far as uh, school is concerned 85% of my revenues are derived from running of a school 5% is from a yoga center and let's say 10% of my revenues is nothing but the rental income so the question really is that and will the school and and let's say the school has been enjoying tax exemption under 1023 6 so the question is given this fact pattern what about the eligibility of tax exemption under 1023 6 so before the supreme court ruling in the case of new noble education i think the law was very clear that as long as my predominant objective is a charitable activity or is is imparting education which is there in section 1023 c so as long as my predominant objective is running of a school the fact that i may have some other objects which in this case is running of a yoga center or or providing uh, halls or grounds on rent that that should not be fatal to my tax exemption and the tax exemption should be available all throughout and this is a position which has been accepted by the department it has been upheld by the supreme court in fact in fact by a five judge bench supreme court in queens education so so this was something which was never an issue but now what has changed so what has changed is that uh, the supreme court in new noble education they have analyzed section 1023c6 and and you know which i will just project on the screen so what 1023c6 says that any income which is received by any person on behalf of a university or educational institution existing solely for educational purpose is exempt okay so what the supreme court has essentially said that if the law is very clear if there is no ambiguity in law then 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 what is the need of bringing a predominant purpose test if the law is very clear that you have to exist solely for educational and and the supreme court has you know devoted several paragraphs on how does one interpret solely but the sum and substance what is coming out from it is that solely would mean exclusively and you should you should be in existence only for educational purposes and not for any other purposes so which is what the supreme court has said so in the fact pattern in our case it is very clear that i am not existing solely for education because i have two other activities as well which is 
running of a yoga center and a business activity of providing halls on rent. So given that I am not uh, given that I am not existing solely for educational purpose, I think Supreme Court is very clear. It has expressly overruled the other previous decisions and has said that if such is the fact pattern, then the tax exemption which you are otherwise enjoying under 1023C, I think I think that that tax exemption is uh, completely lost. Which is what the sum and substance of the Supreme Court ruling in uh, New Noble Education Society is concerned. So one may wonder that, okay, as far as 1023C is concerned, the exemption is jeopardized. I may not be able to claim an exemption. But 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 what if in the same fact pattern the school is registered under Section 11 and not under 1023C? So there, I think I think it should be possible to take a view that the decision of the Supreme Court was confined only to 1023C and it was not confined to section 11. And, and, and even if you observe the language of 1023C and section 11, it is a, I think the language is starkingly different because unlike 1023C, the condition of solely does not exist in section 11. What section 11 read with 215 tells us is that you just need to fit into the definition of charitable purpose. And, and, and as we have seen in the earlier side, slide, Education is one of the charitable purpose. Even medical relief is one of the charitable purpose. So as long as I may have multiple charitable objects, I think as far as section 11 eligibility is concerned, I think we should be fairly comfortable. But 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 as far as 1023C is concerned or the existing schools or even hospitals which may be claiming 1023C exemption, I think, I think that is something which will completely go away now. So sort of, uh, you're saying yeah. that Many of these educational institutions will now start exploring whether to continue registered, depending on the fact pattern they have, Correct. whether they continue to be registered under 1023C or migrate to 11. So they exactly, exactly. They will be evaluating that. Right, right, right. Well, you know, if I, to be honest, sort of uh, very difficult for a school only for education because. Uh, they have the infrastructure facilities and at times there is a utility of most of this right so yeah I agree agree Aditya. i think i think i think that is a challenge and, and and therefore we are seeing many clients you know who are exploring whether to migrate from 1023c okay. to section 11 given that section 11 is a bit broad as far as okay. as compared to 1023c is concerned but even the migration will have their own challenges. I think I think that is a topic for another day. But I think that migration also has its own tax consequences. I understand. I understand. Right. Okay. So 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 moving ahead. Uh, now let's say now let's say uh, let's continue with the same example. But now let's say the school has only one activity, which is nothing but running of a school itself which is of course not prohibited under 1023C because now I am solely existing for educational purpose. So in this case study, what we are trying to do is that, that if we see the background or the profitability track record of the school, what we find is that over the past six years, my revenues have soared from 100 crores to 400 crores. If you look at my profitability, the profitability has increased from 35% in year one to 50% in year six. Now, if such is the fact pattern, the question before the Supreme Court was what 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 happens to the tax exemption under 1023C6? So, so like we discussed about the interpretation of the word solely, and, and, and again, if I can go back to 1023C, there is a, another qualifying criteria in 1023C itself, which says that not only you should exist solely for educational purpose, you should not even you should not even ex be existing for the purpose of profit. So, so can somebody say that this educational institution is existing for the purpose of profit? And since this is also one of the prerequisite for granting an exemption under Section 10, and given that you have such a beautiful track record of profitability, your exemption under 1023C6 will be denied. So the, so the answer really is that, you know, before the Supreme Court decision, you know, we had Supreme Court in Queen's Education, which had said that even if you are generating surplus or profits, as long as the profits are being redeployed into the school or into the hospital, whatever be it, that should not be a problem. But what 
the supreme court in new noble education has said that uh, that no as long as you are earning nominal or marginal profits we don't have an issue but the moment you start earning super normal profits or you know ex exorbitant profits then your very genesis of being regarded as a charitable institution you know comes into question and 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 of course the supreme court has not said that you know what is nominal profit what is marginal profit what is extraordinary profit is it 5% 10% 15% i think those are all open questions but but the common thread uh, you know which is running across both the supreme court decision is that if somebody finds out that you are actually not doing charity but you are actually profiteering and 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 even though you may you know redeploy the surplus back into the school or back into the hospital but the moment you have such uh, abnormal or such huge profits the exemption itself can be denied especially in the context of 1023c given the express language uh, which is there i think i think uh, i think before the supreme court decision i think this was a fact pattern i think there was no challenge at all but after the supreme court decision given that i am earning huge profits on a year on year basis i think i think that will create a challenge and 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 even if we read the supreme court decision you know in one of the sentences they have given a leeway to say that if you have a surplus in a given year or let's say if you have a surplus in a given set of years that is not an issue if the surplus is being generated in the course of your educational activities but but if you are having a consistent surplus on a year on year basis and 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 if somebody you know sees your financials your track record and comes to a conclusion that you know this is nothing but profiteering it is not a charitable activity but it is actually a business activity which you are carrying out then then there could be a challenge so so the no, question no, is no, how your point to me hmm. i always thought that uh, this uh, profiteering hmm. uh, was discussed in the context of the gpu ruling and hmm. profiteering was not discussed in the context of this new one new new one ruling hmm. so but hmm. can we apply the analogy here Yes, no, no. So, so other day you have hit the nail on the butt. So, so exactly. I think you know if you read the decisions contextually, mm. both the decisions seem to give a flavor that as long as you are profiteering, then then you are not a institution which is existing for charitable purpose, and 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 that is why uh, even and and especially in the context of ten twenty three c, which uses express language that you should not be for the purpose of profit. so for section 11 i may still have a defense to say that you know there is no similar condition in section 11 unlike section 1023c mm -hmm. but 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 if you are a 1023c registered school or a hospital or whatever mm -hmm. then and if you are having uh, these profits on a year on year basis then then definitely it's a challenge so only and, one and, is, uh, from so i'll say that uh, good profits or handsome mm -hmm. profits the only bucket which is left is those per se six categories correct correct okay. so so even for the per se six categories also i think i think there also the debate is still on that whether you can generate profits from your per se categories so there also i think you know we have had internal discussions we have debated with councils but but the preponderant view which is emerging is that that even if you are having exorbitant profits from your per se six categories i think i think that is also also an issue mm. And, and you know what what we are told is and and you know uh, that if we are able to justify why these profits are made so let's say if i am having a future expansion plan or a capex which is planned out or let's say if i have incurred losses in the earlier years and this profits are nothing but the recoupment of losses which i have made then i think i may still be in a position you know to argue that uh, uh, i am not existing for the purpose of profits because these are merely recou recoupment of the losses which i have suffered or these are to fund the future capex plans which i may have so if such is the fact pattern then perhaps i may be able to take a view that i am still a charitable organization but but if that is not the fact pattern then then i think uh, you know claiming a tax exemption on on this limited ground could could definitely be a challenge i understand sir but the fear cycle mm. which these rulings have created especially the mm. ruling on gpu <laughs> we are thinking that jada nahi kam don't earn money don't earn too much money you cannot right. earn too much but believe me uh, as i spoke mm. to you in the month of september uh, prior mm. to these two rulings uh, you would have said no that is not a problem if you are redeploying that money for the purpose of charity not at all a problem it's a clearly complete change complete i think all those principles just you know go down the drain right you know, 
So I just imagine it's like Supreme Court has written a completely a new code. Correct. You know, till September, till the time you're redeploying that money for charitable purposes, mm. you, you profit was never a point of discussion. Mm. How much profit mm. you're making? You're making 200 percent also. That was never a subject of discussion. But now with this ruling, hmm. uh, I hope all the educational institutions, which are either under 1023C or whether they are under uh, 215, they fall whichever category, they they bring down the school fees <laughs> nowadays. Clearly, clearly. Yeah. Sorry. Right. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, so, so yeah, this was as far as your, you know, profiteering is concerned and, and, you know, and, and one thing, you know, which may not be out of place to discuss over here is that what is the impact of the decision being prospective, you know, uh, Aditya touched upon in his opening remarks that the new noble education decision is prospective and it will not impact the law, which, you know, all, which earlier we understood thus far. And, and if we quickly look into the observations of the Supreme Court on the prospective part, the Supreme Court says that this court is further of the opinion that since the present judgment has departed from the previous rulings regarding the meaning of the term solely, then in order to avoid disruption and to give time to institutions likely to be affected to make appropriate changes and adjustments, it would be in the larger interest of the society that the present judgment operates year after. And, and as a result, it is hereby directed that the law declared in the present judgment shall operate prospectively. So, so here also, you know, one issue which comes up and, and which we have also been discussing with various uh, councils is to the extent to which we can apply the prospective part of this ruling. And, and the view which is emerging is that the prospective part is only limited to the interpretation of the term solely, you know, which is what is highlighted by the Supreme Court. So, for example, let's say an educational institution has two or three objects and, 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 and given that it has to now amend its object clause so that it fits into the definition of solely, I think it is for this only limited purpose, the ruling will be applied prospectively. But, but for example, let's say if you are having sizable profits in the earlier years, so it is not that the Supreme Court is not that the tax office is not going to attack you on the sizable profits which you are earning. Because now, after the Supreme Court decision, that is the law which was always there since inception. So, 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 so personally, I feel that we may not be able to take recourse to say that now this ruling applies prospectively. So it's not that whatever has been done in the past, whatever profits have made in the past, those will go completely untaxed. I think the department can very well say that the prospective applicability is only for the purpose of solely and only for the purpose of you amending the object loss. But 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 if the fact pattern is that you have been profiteering over all these years, then then that is something you know which can still be challenged by the revenue, maybe by a reassessment, rectification, whatever it is. But 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 you may not be able to take shelter on the uh, prospective part. Okay. Okay, so while we were talking about profitability, you know, let's consider a simple example where let's say there is a hospital. Okay, and, and, and as we know that the hospitals, I think there are various categories of rooms. Let's say there is a super deluxe room, there is a deluxe room, there is a general ward. And, 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 and let's say if I do a segmental analysis of the revenue and profitability, you know, I can very well have a situation where my Super deluxe rooms are earning a revenue of 200 crores and having a profitability of 50%. Whereas a general ward, which is let's say a 80% occupancy or 80% beds are reserved for general ward, that may be generating a revenue of 800 crores. But but that may actually be a negative surplus because whatever profits I'm earning from my other two categories, those are used to subsidize the general ward category. So let's say my surplus in the general ward is a, actually a loss of uh, 150 crores. And if I look into my profitability percentage, it is 50%, 40%, and minus 18.75%. And if I club the results of the hospital together, what I find is that my total revenue is 1500 crores. My surplus is 150. And on an entity level, I'm just earning 10%. And then for the sake of our discussion, let's assume that 10% is something which is nominal and which may not be challenged by the department. So the question over here is, can the tax officer still say that as long as your super deluxe rooms or your deluxe rooms are concerned, you are actually doing a business. And since, since you are doing a business, you do not 
fulfill the uh, definition of a charitable purpose and your exemption can be denied to uh, to this extent i think i think this personally i feel it's a theoretical risk i think what we need to understand is that we have to look at a uh, one segment as a whole and and and, and as long as i uh, look at one segment as a whole and if i am able to substantiate that my profitability is only 10% then 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 this should ideally not be a challenge but but where this could possibly a challenge is something which we will discuss in the next case study where where let's say uh, not a hospital but let's say i am an institution which is imparting skill to let's say underprivileged people be it blind people handicapped or whatever so i am running a institution for the benefit of those and and it clearly falls in the definition of charitable purpose because it is a advancement of general public utility and and given that i am imparting skills to such people and and let's say based on the skills which i have imparted let's say those people are actually uh, manufacturing furniture and let's say in that furniture is something which is being sold in the open market and and let's say the furniture let's say a table costing 10000 is being sold at 20000 rupees so the question is can this sale of furniture be regarded as an incidental business activity Uh, assuming if it is regarded as an incidental business activity, whether profits in such incidental business are permissible, and what is the importance to maintain separate books of accounts? So, so thus far, what we have seen is that you know, generally many such organizations, and you know, there are several such cases where where you know there could be some incidental commercial activity being carried out, but but there are no books of accounts maintained for those activities. and and which is where you know section 11 plays a very very vital role and and i will just project that so if you look at the portion which is highlighted in the red which is section 11 subsection 4a it says that you know subsection 1 of section 11 will not apply in relation to income of a trust being profits and gains of business unless the business is incidental to the attainment of the objective of the trust and separate books of accounts are maintained by such trust or institution in respect of such business so so what can possibly happen is the department can very well say that sale of furniture is an incidental business because whatever surplus you are generating from those business you are redeploying it into your main uh, main activity so 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 let's say the department agrees that it is an incident, incidental business but but if but if i am not maintaining separate books of accounts for such business then then my entire uh, profits from those activities can come under challenge and 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 it is not only the profits which can come under the challenge my entire registration can get liable to be cancelled and 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 why why this is so is because of an amendment i think which was brought in last year and the amendment basically listed down various parameters on how on when the registration can be cancelled which which is something which we have discussed in the next case study yes so this is the amendment which i am talking about section 12ab subsection 4 and if we read this amendment so this is one of the conditions or one of the uh, one of the criteria which the revenue can use to cancel your registration and and what is the criteria and if we read it says that if the institution has profits and gains of business which is not incidental to the attainment of its objectives or separate books of accounts are not maintained by such institution in the respect of business which is incidental so in, so in this fact pattern given that sale of furniture is incidental to my uh, charitable activity assuming i don't maintain separate books of accounts for such activity 12ab subsection 4 tells me that this is a condition and 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 if the department invokes this condition my registration is liable to be cancelled And, and 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 the game doesn't stop here you know what happens so what are the consequences once your registration get cancelled and and you know many of us may be aware that there is a new section 115 td which was you know brought about a couple of years back which said that if your registration is cancelled then whatever is the fair market value of the assets of the trust of the net assets rather assets minus liabilities whatever is the fmv of your net assets on that fmv uh, the revenue can impose a tax at mmr which can be you know as high as 30 35% so so let's say in this case let's say if it's a building you know it will have land building hospitals whatever 
So the fair market value, I'm sure, will run into thousands of crores of rupees. So even for a small, uh, you know, procedural lapse or whatever I may say, that if my books of accounts are not maintained, and and you know that gives a handle to the tax office to cancel my registration, then the consequences are you know very very severe. And and this is something which you know all of us need to be mindful of. We need to be mindful of whether the activities which I am doing as a trust, whether it is per se charitable activities, is there any element of business? whether that business can be regarded as incidental or non-incidental. And, and if it is incidental, whether I'm maintaining separate books of accounts or not, I think all those questions, you know, will assume paramount significance given the way the decisions are coming, given the way the Supreme Court is interpreting the law. And, and, and I think it will assume far more significance in the days to come. So, Saurabh, say, hmm. uh, let me give you a hypothetical situation. So if there's a charitable mm -hmm. institution which is uh, uh, building skill, helping build skills, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, for the underprivileged or or the handicapped, let me put it the handicapped in some manner. And in that course, that product is getting created, and then you're putting mm -hmm. and then you're regenerating revenue. I mean, how will you call it? Will you call it incidental? And even if you call it incidental, how will you create a separate books of accounts? Because uh, in the course of you know teaching the unskilled or the handicapped or mm. you know you know you would have seen in Diwali and all of this mm. from many charitable institutions they are making chocolates and so mm. it's about skilling the handicapped also and the product as a consequence of that skilling mm. and is being sold in the market. How do you create a segment out of it? Clearly, yeah. I think this is the difficulty and, you know, this is where, unfortunately, the Supreme Court has said that, that you know, because all throughout we have been assuming that, you know, this is something which is incidental, my predominant objective is charitable, so I need not worry about it. And, and that is where the Supreme Court decision, you know, cuts through the roof to say that, you know, it is a business activity, you are selling your products at market rate or, or maybe at more than market rate also. And if such is the fact pattern, then, then we will not give cognizance to the fact that 95% of your activity could be charitable and this is just a minuscule 5% part. So, so, so the Supreme Court is very clear, you know, to say that this is a business activity. And then once it is a business activity, you need to maintain separate books of accounts. And, and you know, that is the fallout. And, and, and the way we have dissected the law and, you know, even such a procedural lapse of not maintaining a books of accounts can, you know, lead to cancellation of my registration and, and the harsh consequences under 115TD. But, but I think, unfortunately, this is how the way the law is right As now. As we speak, there's a question. What happens yeah. if, I know there's a separate Q&A session, we are reaching that sure. time. So the question is, uh, uh, what happens if the underprivileged wages are offset by the sale of the furniture and the profits pay their wages. Hmm. No, exactly. So I think this is where, you know, the whole discussion mm -hmm. earlier was that, that, that if there are profits and those profits are used to pay their wages or their profits are deployed in my charitable activity, there was no issue no, as no such. Issue, but now, but, but, but now, now all that fundamental principle just goes away, which is the, you know, unfortunate part of this ruling. So redeployment back into the object of the trust saved us a mm. lot of troubles. But somewhere, the, somewhere the court has distinguished commerce trade business as a separate thing and redeployment as a separate thing. So they've, they've, the linkage which was there, which was helping me save this whole mm. issue, you know, mm. letting me get through, that, that, that thing has been distinguished now. So I have to independently show whether it's a trade commerce business, it's a business activity. If it is incidental, then a separate segment has to be created. So all that mm -hmm. hardship is now getting created. Yes, yes, that's right. Sort of. Uh, is there any other case uh, case study? Or yeah, what? yeah. There is just one last case study which we can discuss. Please. Okay. Yeah. So, so while we were on this incidental business, uh, you know, and this case study is just to bring home the point as to you know when can something be regarded as incidental and when can something not be regarded as incidental. So, so, so let's say I am a full-fledged hospital and, and, you know, as many of us know that a hospital also has an in-house pharmacy. 
and that enhanced pharmacy can cater to my uh, inpatients as well as to general public. So, so even I can step in the hospital and buy some medicines and walk out. And and let's say those enhanced pharmacy is generating substantial profits. So the so the question really is that uh, whether profits in incidental business are permissible. I think the answer is yes, because because as we saw that unlike a GPU where there is a restriction that your business revenues cannot exceed twenty percent, there is no such restriction in your per se categories, and and hospital will form part of your medical relief category, and there is a no eighty twenty ratio mentioned over there. So, so one view of the matter is that, you know, as far as your core activities are concerned, you cannot do profiteering, mm -hmm. but the way the law is, as far as your incidental business activities is concerned, there is no embargo or prohibition. I can very well have, you know, significant profits in my incidental business, of course, subject to test of morality and the Supreme Court even, you know, coming down on it. But currently the way the law is, you know, the profits in incidental business are permissible. But the bigger question over here would be that when can something be regarded as incidental? Because somebody might very well say that the pharmacy is nothing but a very integral or a core part of your of your activity of running a hospital. So it can never be regarded as incidental. And, and you know, this is just pharmacy. You can have a pathology lab or a radiology department or whatever. So, so can you say that those categories or those functions which a hospital does, is it incidental to the main object of providing medical relief or it is so integral or so core to the overall or the primary activity that it can never be regarded as incidental. So, so of course, there is no right or wrong answer I, in my opinion. I think we need to get into the facts to see that whether something can be regarded as incidental or it is something which is getting subsumed in the primary activity. I think I think that is something which one needs to take care of. And and lastly, and and, and of course, I think we'll just take two minutes before we uh, go to Q&A. One important observation in the Supreme Court decision was that the CBDT circulars, uh, what is the binding nature of the circulars? And we all know that the CBDT circulars are binding on the revenue and they are not binding on the taxpayers or courts. But the Supreme Court in this case has made very interesting observations to say that the circulars are also not binding on the tax department if they are not in accordance with the law. And, and, and all throughout, you know, based on various decisions, Navneet Lal Javeri, Yuko Bank, etc., we have always been taking a position that once a CBTT or the board comes out with a circular, howsoever absurd that circular maybe that circular is binding on the revenue. But I think now the Supreme Court is making a departure from that position that no, if, if somebody finds out if the department is able to prove that the circular is not in accordance with the law, then it is not even binding on the department. So the whole shelter of the CBDT circular, which, which you know, taxpayers used to enjoy, whether that shelter is being taken away or not, I think that is something, you know, which time will tell. But, but this is some uh, important facet, which is, you know, coming out from the ruling. As far as and, you know, this is not only out here. Hmm. This principle applied, then you would appreciate there's so many other hmm. issues which will start opening up actually where this correct. has been taken. Correct, correct. Hmm. And just one thing, sorry, before we move into the way forward, I would correct. request uh, that if you could put your questions in the Q and A box. Uh, we've already seen one question. Two, one was answered in the discussion, and one in, more we have received. In the meantime, if you can put your question in the question answer box, which is at the center of the screen, uh, bottom center, then we could uh, we could answer this after the discussion. Please, uh, Saurabh. Sure. Sure. I think I think as far as way forward is concerned, you know, I mean, based on whatever uh, we discussed, I think all of us will appreciate that you know this actually these decisions have caused an disruption. So, what exactly can be done going forward? One, of course, for 1023C and given the interpretation of solely, if you are a taxpayer who is registered under 1023C, then the first and foremost thing one should do is to change the object clause so that you fit into the parameters which are described by the Supreme Court. If you are earning profits, which can be supernormal, exorbitant or whatever. Now, whether those profits are synced with the jurisprudence, like how we discussed, whether it represents a recoupment of losses or you are earning surplus because you have a capex lined up i think i think all those questions will will be of far more significance and 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 and, and of course like we discussed on what is our main activity what is an incidental activity 
what is the profits which are permissible in both the activities whether you are maintaining separate books of accounts or not i think i think all those you know sanity checks health checks or whatever we may call i think that is something which will be extremely important and more so for the reason that if you are not complying with any of these things the consequences are very harsh because once my registration get cancelled and if the revenue are to apply 115 td i think that we are staring at a very very big tax liability and and lastly as aditya mentioned that you know if such is the contours and you know given that so many conditions restrictions is there is there a way or migration possible for a for profit entity because because why do i you know stick my neck out and take a particular position if if let's say i'm you know to achieve certainty or peace of mind let's say if i'm able to carry out the same activities in a profitable organization and and that is something a call any management would have to take so that you have anything to add no no i think so i see i have some things to many things to add but uh, i am happy there are some questions and we are running out of time it's sure. already 3:30 so i'll straight away go to the question there's a question that if a non gpu trust is incurring losses year on year from sale of products made by handicapped people then can we say it is not running business not profit intention hence not required to maintain books of accounts no i would say it will still be required to maintain books of account because the fact remains that you are selling products you are doing a business activity now just that the business activity is running into a loss may not you know absolve you from the requirement of maintaining books of accounts i think i think in so, if such as a fact that many pattern, times it happens hmm what the handicapped people would have prepared you would undersell it just you know it's like hmm. okay more for creating awareness <coughs> also and mm. then through this awareness donations come so the objective mm. is not you just put up a display center and you sell it just because mm. i mean the sale uh, it's a it's mm. a you know and that's why there's another question uh, i don't know how to answer mm. this is that uh, <coughs> separate books of accounts have not been defined under the act any queue how trust should maintain separate books of accounts <laughs> <laughs> no yeah, i think i think there is a cbdt circular which had uh, you know come out recently uh, in the year 2022 and i think we can share with with them mm-hmm. i think what the circular uh, i think they enlisted what are the books of accounts which a charitable institution should maintain whether it's a cash book or a bank book or a receipt and expenditure account i think i think there is a circular to this effect which has recently been issued by the board yes. which actually prescribes the uh, documentation which one needs to maintain sir so one question whether the uh, bus fee collected for school bus service for own students is incidental activity answer is yes yes answer is yes i think i think their supreme court has also you know given some examples to say that if a school is selling textbook or providing hospital faci- oh, sorry hostel facilities for its own students then that is something which is incidental and and, and i'm sure even a school bus service for own students should form part of that will institutions claiming exemption under section 11 have to revisit the pricing example hostel fee charge for students to cost plus nominal markup <coughs> as per the supreme court decision well if you are act- uh, if you are actually having obnoxious profits you definitely need to revisit that agreed agreed okay and uh, then there is a question i don't know this is not theek okay, what is the role of 85% of income should be spent in a year as per the income tax provision after these rulings nothing changes i think so sorry we can yeah 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 nothing changes i think the fact that 15% accumulation is allowed and 85% you have to spend i think that will still remain because that is one of the conditions to claim exemption under 11 but here the bigger aspect is whether the 100 which you are earning out of which there is a bifurcation of 15 and 85 whether that 100 is appropriate or not i think that is the larger question with the supreme court that's dealt with can an educational institution claiming exemption under 1023c clause 6 enter into an agreement with associates or third parties to give vacant land of area of school to mises on rent no no as we discussed i think given the interpretation of solely i think i think you you may not be able to claim an exemption if you are giving something on the rent to whatever third parties or associates you know, or a, whatever so it's not a constructed cap a car parking space is just that i have hmm. in a portion which is vacant no use for hmm. me 
and mm-hmm. someone think that can I use that when it's a third party mm-hmm. <coughs> that that mm-hmm. rental you cannot give it on but yeah, not so, not about park, constructing a car parking and doing sales but it's simple rental income correct correct so if you are under section 11 then perhaps possibly it should not be an issue mm-hmm. but under 1023c i think it's after totally. new novel it can be a challenge yes. Yes. Uh, there are more questions coming i don't know but uh, uh, let me see right uh, any views of differentiation drawn by the supreme court between section 4 and business carried on by trust section 11 subsection 4a All right. So Supreme Court had, uh, you know, devoted a couple of paragraphs on 11.4 and 11.4a. And, and, you know, one glimpse of the Supreme Court decision seems to, you know, perhaps take a view that if there is a business which has been carried out by the trust and and given that 11.4 permits a trust to do a business, then that should not be an issue. And mm-hmm. and 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 eleven four should actually override eleven four a, but but still you know the common thread which was running that you know that business etc is possible under eleven four, provided because the Supreme Court has caveated to say that it should be based on a nominal markup or a marginal uh, profits. But mm-hmm. but but again we are back to square one to say that even if there is a permission given mm-hmm. under eleven four, if there are uh, exorbitant profits. Then, then, then that could still be an issue. Yeah. Done. I think sort of the we'll close it because we have to start sure. this session. We'll take a break of four or five minutes. We'll I request the audience all can go for a body break. We'll just hold and everyone can hold on for three to four minutes and we'll start with the next session on partnership. Thank you, Saurabh. It was a delight. Sure. To have you. Please stay on for the session on partnership also. Yes. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.
welcome back uh, now we will start with part 2 of a session which is uh, regarding the supreme court decision in case of mansur and this is regarding uh, partnership firms even though there has been an amendment uh, in 2020 so there is a new law there is a new code on this particular dissolution it has a the tax impact when there is a dissolution or retirement of a partner but uh, but you do get to know that what has been the psyche around uh, the change which happened in 1987 because all cases between 1987 2020 they'll all get uh, affected by this and i can tell you knowing the way it has happened in india <coughs> i'm sure the way it happens in india this is definitely happened in rampant that a dissolution this kind of a position was taken for admission or retirement this kind of a position was taken so this is very important for the for those partnership firms who have done some sort of a reconstitution uh, between the periods 87 to 2020 now partnership firm as we all know is the most commonly adopted mode to carry on business in india for a medium sized enterprise the level of compliances regulatory norms and cost for maintaining a partnership firm or even an llp is relatively cheaper with some as a company structure now having said that from a tax perspective partnership firm and llp are taxed at a bit, with a basic tax rate being 30 surcharge says added and any thing which is after that that is payment of profit post tax profit all of that is exempt in the hands of the partners this seems quite a simplistic tax regime partnership firms but partnership but i'm you know i'm laughing because i know these partnership firms have their own share of tax challenges especially when it comes to admission retirement or dissolution and uh, the kind of questions i have heard in the last decade what will happen and everyone has a different view it could be this it could be this someone is confident of a particular view so i think there is more ambiguity which is there than in any other part of the income tax act we just finished discussing how the law with respect to charitable organizations taxability has evolved and still lot of issues remain unresolved but believe me partnership firms have their own share of roller coaster ride in terms of taxability on retirement and dissolution this is a quite a vex issue today we would uh, discuss this but, but interestingly the amendment uh has put in a complicated mechanism but probably brought clarity and clarity what has to be done from 2020 onwards but till 2020 this 87 to 2020 period is uh, is a phase where there is utter confusion today we would discuss the supreme court judgment on this very aspect which has raised more question and concern than settling the controversy around this topic you know for this i need to go back to the <coughs> period before 1987 <coughs> go back going back to 1987 period prior period to 87 partnership firms and its partners were treated as the same and any distribution of capital assets on dissolution of a firm to its partners was specifically not considered as a transfer under section 47 sub section 2 <coughs> <coughs> similarly any distribution of capital asset by a firm to its partners on retirement was not chargeable to tax under the judge made laws because there was no written laws <coughs> so in the judge made laws it was not there the courts considered that the amount paid to the retiring partner was only towards his or her share in the net assets of the partnership firm and there was no element of transfer of partnership interest in the partnership assets by the retiring partner to the continuing partners the partner was not able not liable to tax as what he or she received <coughs> or something which is always belonging to him or her in form or of his or her share in the firm's assets <coughs> as this resulted in a kind of tax abuse where assets were transferred among individuals routing the same through partnership firm and we would have heard umpteen cases this would have happened in the prior 87 period <coughs> and using the admission or retirement mechanism to escape tax uh, taxation when a party was transferring asset to b party 
So he introduces B as a partner and then A retires and B continues as a partner, the asset is transferred and on distribution, there's no tax. So all of that used to happen prior to 87. <coughs> Government got a wind of it. In order to plug this loophole, the legislature deleted the exemption which was provided under section 47, clause two, and introduced two new sections in the statute. One was 45.3 and 45.4. 45.3 provided for taxability when assets are introduced into the partnership firm on admission. And 45.4 provided for taxability on distribution of assets upon dissolution or otherwise. Although the draftsman with a view to curb the tax avoidance mechanism inserted these sections, but the ambiguity upon the applicability of the section 45.4 on reconstitution of partnership firm <coughs> remained a matter of debate before this landmark ruling was passed. In this Supreme Court ruling, in case of Mansukh Dain, uh, can Vasan, you can move to the next slide, at least. Yeah. Uh, although my colleague Vasan will discuss the whole ruling in very much detail, but you know, just to talk about the ruling with not even a slide, it would have been very difficult to do. So I just put up a single slide. Although uh, it's actually a tale of more than ten partners. You know, partners were there, some retired, some came in, some then again retired. So it's a inflow and outflow of partners which has happened <clears throat> so each step will be explained in detail who came in when and what happened but i'll give you a broad contour of this ruling so in this supreme court ruling it was held that the revaluation of capital asset of partnership firm by corresponding credit to the capital account of the partner would be taxable as capital gains now as you can see from the slide the case involved retirement of few partners subsequent admission of few partners, followed by revaluation of assets, and finally credit to the partner's capital account towards the revalued amounts. The said revalued, <coughs> revalued amounts were in fact withdrawn by two old partners. You know, withdrawn by two old partners, the Supreme Court want to put an end to certain mischief. Rather, the, judy, uh, the parliament first wanted to put an end it and Supreme Court has actually supported that. But here, I don't know whether it was to put a check to a mischief or whether it went overboard, but, but let's let's go through the ruling. The Honorable Judge ruled upon substantial question of law, which dealt with the interpretation of the term or otherwise in old section 45.4, which was inserted by Finance Act 1987. The Supreme Court held that credit of revaluation gain to partners' capital accounts can be said to be in effect distribution of assets valued at fair market value. Reason being, as some of the partners admitted with small amounts of capital, immediately had huge amounts of capital post revaluation, which was available for withdrawal. The Supreme Court held that the revaluation involved credit to partners' capital account could be regarded as transfer for the purpose of or otherwise under section 45 subsection 4. The view taken by the earlier, so this is uh, this view was actually taken by the High Court in one of the cases. It was uh, in the case of A.K. and Nayak, yeah, and Nayak, in relation to the interpretation of the term or otherwise be read as the same kind with the term transfer of capital assets by way of distribution of capital assets, and not with the term dissolution. And this was finally upheld by the Supreme Court. As per the Supreme Court, this ruling is aligned with the intent of the legislature behind insertion of section 45, subsection 4, and simultaneously withdrawal of 47, clause 2, which was done by Finance Act 1987. And this was all done to stop the leakage happening due to misuse of the partnership firms as a vehicle to avoid capital gains tax. The addition is relevant to all open litigations related to the time period AY 88-1988-89 to AY 21-22 as this version of 45.4 on which the decision of Supreme Court is being discussed has undergone the change from 1st April 2020. Now, this was about the Supreme Court. You know, the story is not complete. If I don't discuss what is after 2020. Now, under the latest regime, we have two sections. A modified section 45 subsection 4 and a new section 9b. Both these sections apply in different scenarios and also have interplay amongst themselves, which my colleague Basan would also be deliberating. Uh, so we just did not restrict ourselves to the Supreme Court ruling. What after that? 
what happens today. So we took liberty to discuss the amended law a little bit also. Uh, but however, as the law stands today, while it is a bit complex in terms of understanding the mechanism of interplay between 45.4, the revised 45.4 and the section new section 9b, but it's somewhere properly, it's you know, properly addresses the issues which have been long uh, open or there was a confusion around it. Complexity in mechanism, but, but clarity in the outcome. Let me put it this way. Now with this, uh, I would like to invite my colleague uh, Basant, if you could uh, take all of us to the ruling in detail and a couple of uh, case studies and also discuss the amended law. Over to you, Basant, please. Thank you, Aditya, for uh, these opening comments and remarks on this era of partnership which we have seen for more than last two decades. So as you as, as Aditya rightly pointed out, we have we had there was an era prior to 1987, and then there was this period from 1987 till 2020. And now, as we see today, we have the new legislation post 2020 onwards. So this decision which we are going to discuss is pertaining to uh, the period which was post-1987 and prior to 2020. Now, earlier, when we when we go back, when we take a step back, prior to 1987, the partners and the partnership firm were considered as one and the same. And this was actually used by many as a tool to avoid taxation. It was quite easy for anyone to put in assets in a partnership firm and pass over that asset through retirement by inducting a new partner. In the, so, so partnership firm became a tool for kind of a tax avoidance. And that is where from Finance Act 1987, the law was amended and the exemption granting section, which existed prior to 1987, the legislature deleted that exemption section. If, if I may use that word exemption section uh, for simplicity, section 47 clause two, uh, which earlier granted uh, non-taxability to anyone who could take out the assets from the partnership firm on dissolution, that law got amended. At the same time, simultaneously by the same Finance Act, what happened is that two new sections were introduced. One was 45 subsection 3 and the other one 45 subsection 4. As the loophole was uh, with respect to both the aspects in terms of introducing an asset to the partnership firm and also withdrawing the assets from the partnership firm, the first section 45.3 uh, resorted to cases where assets were introduced by the partners into the firm. And the second section 45.4, which is, uh, which, is, which is the case which we've been discussing today and the Supreme Court ruling, this dealt with cases where partners used to uh, take the assets from the partnership firm upon dissolution, which till 1987 was not taxable. So with this amendment, which was there from Finance Act 1987, that the, the whole gamut of taxability of partnership underwent a sea change, and there was no specific exemption available. Uh, after this amendment, there had been a lot of decisions from the High Court, and in fact, from the Supreme Court also, uh, which had held on various fact patterns as to what, what is the taxability in a particular scenario. One of the key decisions which was there, uh, which, which also finds place in our discussion in the Supreme Court matter, is the ANI decision of the Bombay High Court. I'll just spend one time, dis uh, one a minute discussing this Bombay, uh, Bombay High Court decision of ANI. This was a case where uh, the partnership firm was, uh, was constituted by family members, which was, a, which was a, quite a big family. And due to the family settlement, they decided to segregate the assets. And as a consequence, some of the partners retired from the firm and some of the partners were admitted in that partnership firm. And in that process, what happened, the assets of the firm were also transferred to, were also distributed to some of the partners within reconstitution, within the retirement phase itself. And there was no dissolution as such of the partnership firm at that point of time. In that context, uh, what the Bombay High Court held is that effectively there is a movement of assets from the partnership firm to the respective partners who are taking away the assets and the continuing partners are compromising the assets uh, in the partnership firm in favor of the partners who are leaving the firm. In that context, the Bombay High Court held that although there was no dissolution in this case, but it was 
covered under section 454 because essentially there was a movement of assets from the firm to the partners and and the and the retirement also happened with this background uh, there has been other de decisions also uh, by the judiciary where where typical cases in terms of uh, how the taxability would work in where only cash was taken away by the partner or in fact there was no revaluation as such but there were just balances or any assets were distributed so each and every fact pattern there has been quite a lot of controversy as to what is the correct position of the law in terms of taxability of reconstitution of partnership whenever there are distribution by of the assets by the firm now moving to this decision which we which we are supposed to discuss today is the decision of supreme court in the case of mansukh dying and printing mills uh this decision uh, i'll take you to the facts because the facts are very very hold a very key in terms of what the outcome of the supreme court was in this decision initially this uh, partnership firm mansukh dying constituted of four partners the these four partners were all brothers and the partnership firm was engaged in the business of dyeing printing and uh, dyeing and printing of and trading of clothing related items uh what happened in 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 the tax year 1991 there were admission of admission of three partners in the firm and effectively one of the old partners they he he his share of profit was compromised in favor of the incoming two partners incoming three partners so to say so if you see from the from the diagram we'll have partners on the left side the three partners continue for uh, for brevity and for uh, for our discussion purposes i have kept them as m n and o who are the old partners who continue with the firm and p also and there are three partners which got admitted q r and s once this admission happened the only change uh, what was there is that one of the partners uh, share got reduced and the admitted three partners got the share which was compromised by the old partner secondly what happened after this uh, immediately there was a retirement of three partners uh, after that admission which effectively meant that mr m o and p in our slide if you may see they retired from the firm and mr n continued with the partnership firm uh, with the three new admit uh, with uh, post this retirement so once this retirement also happened uh, it was a case of these four partners Uh, constituting the partnership firm these all transactions happened in the financial year 1991 92 which was april 1991 to march 1992 finally where there was a there was one partner mr n which was there since inception and there were three new partners who were admitted during the tax year after uh, after this four uh, one these four partners were running their business in the subsequent tax year in 92 93 again four new partners were inducted uh, it may sound a bit confusing but i am trying to be slow so that uh, you know uh, we are there on the facts uh, one the four partners were there if you see on the left hand side of the slide mr n q r and s which were the n being the initial partner who was always there with the partnership firm the three partners q r and s which were admitted in the previous year 91 and the current four new partners which were admitted in the year 1992 mr t u v and w for example now when these partners the four partners were admitted in the in november 1992 they brought in very small amounts of capital which were somewhere in the range of 2 lakh rupees and 4 lakh rupees uh, and that is how they got admitted in the partnership after their admission in the partnership the in that financial year 92 93 they carried on their business during before the end of uh, year 92 93 in fact on the very first day of january 1993 what the partnership firm did is that with their eight partners being there on the partnership firm they revalued their land and building once the revaluation of land and building happened they enhanced the value of land and building and gave a corresponding credit to the partners capital account on all the eight partners so the valuation amount which was revalued was somewhere in the range around of around 17 to 18 crores and the corresponding amounts were created in the capital accounts of all these eight partners the decision uh, is with respect to 
uh, the, the four new partners which got admitted. So if we were to see this, what actually happened is that the new partners which was admitted in the year 1992, if you see on the left hand side of the slide, Mr. T, U, V and W, these partners introduced small amounts of part, uh, small amounts of capital when they were inducted into the firm in, in November 1992. However, once the revaluation happened in 1st January 1993, which was just one and one, one and a half months post the admission, uh, their capital balance uh, got a huge increment because of the revaluation. It didn't stop at there. What happened essentially is that after that revaluation, two of the partners, they withdrew small amounts from their capital balances. And the partners who withdrew their small amounts were not these partners essentially who were admitted in 1992. The two partners which withdrew the amounts were the old partner N, which was already there in the partnerships and inception. And another partner who was in fact inducted in the year 1991 and not the one which were inducted in the year 1992. So, so, so a lot of things have happened uh, in, in the facts of the case, if I may say so. So, that, so there, there was admission of partners followed with retirement. Then, then again, there was an admission of partners where four people came in. Post four people coming in the partnership, there was a revaluation of the firm. Once the revaluation happened, everybody got an upside in the revaluation. And post that, two of the partners withdrew some amount from the from their capital. To top it all, uh, and things went ahead. And in the subsequent tax year, what I meant, the partnership con firm converted itself into a limited company also to make things more interesting, so to say. So we have a admission, retirement, revaluation, followed by withdrawal of capital in one year. And in the subsequent year, there was a conversion of the partnership firm into a limited liability company altogether. At that point of time, when uh, the partnership firms used to be converted into a limited company, there was no specific exemption section given as we see today under section 47, which grants exemption on the conversion. And these exam and these transactions were largely covered by decisions of uh, of Bombay High Court. Uh, the 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 most celebrated one being the Texpin decision, where under Part Nine of the Companies Act, the partnership firms used to be converted into company, and uh, it was only a only a only a mode of change in doing the business, and it was always considered as a tax non taxable transaction. So the firm converted itself into a limited cap company in the next year. And the balances which were there in the partner's capital account became the respective share capital in the hands of the limited in the hands of the shareholders of the limited company. So, in a nutshell, if I were if I were to say what actually happened is that there were reconstitution of partners by addition of partners, there were some retirement of old partners, and again fresh additions. Post that, there were revaluation of land and building, which was created to the partner's capital account, and there was withdrawal from the same post the admission of the four partners. Now what happened when the matter came before uh, the assisting officer for assessment, uh, the assisting officer said that, okay, I understand what has happened, but look, uh, what, has what has happened with the new partners which got admitted in 1992 is that they have brought in very meager sum when they were inducted as a capital, but because the assets have been revalued, they, they, are, they are having a huge sum in their, a huge sum in their capital account. That was an observation of the sitting officer, which means uh, that in a sense, once you're crediting these revaluation gains to the partner's capital account, it would be taxable under section 45.4. This was the this was the uh, this this was the contention of the AO when he was passing the assessment order. And what the assessing officer also did is that he relied on uh, the decision of the AN Nike's Bombay High Court case which we uh, discussed in the initial part of the discussion to say that, you know, in effect, uh, the balances of the capital account of the partners have increased, which are available for withdrawal. And it would be a case where although there is no dissolution, but on retirement, uh, uh, the balances have increased and the, and the, and the partners, partners uh, the partnership firm, sorry, would be subjected to tax under section 45.4. So once the assessing officer passed an order uh, making this transaction as taxable, 
the cit appeals also upheld the view which was taken by the assessing officer as normally happens and uh, this and the cit appeals relied on the decision of the bombay high court also saying that this transaction would be taxable in the hands of the partnership firm however when the matter went before the uh, income tax appellate tribunal uh, the ssc took an argument that you know this transaction would not be taxable because there was a old supreme court judgment uh, which said that uh, if if the facts are the same which is which was there almost in the mansuk dying case where there was a retirement and uh, and balances were taken out of the partner's capital account this would not tend to amount to transfer uh, in the case of hindustan construction that was the decision of the supreme court which was relied upon before the itat uh, so itat gave relief to that taxpayer saying that this transaction is not taxable further the high court also uh, went by the same view and said that uh, the exemption the non taxability should be upheld and uh, the ssc won this case before the high court as well now if finally the matter went before the supreme court uh, uh, where the revenue uh, filed an appeal before the supreme court and the revenue filed an appeal uh, before the supreme court for both the tax years the first tax year where all this revaluation and admission had happened and in the second tax year uh, where uh, the conversion of the partnership firm had happened because essentially when the high court pronounced its judgment uh, the high court said that i am i am saying that your transaction would not be taxable here and in the second place when there is a conversion to avoid non taxability there there would be a taxability at the stage of conversion because at the first place i agree with the view that it should not be taxable in the first year so revenue being aggrieved by uh, by both the matters they appeal before the supreme court and both the years tax matters were before the supreme court the first year being the year in which the retirement admission and the withdrawals happened and the second year being the year in which the partnership firm was converted to a company now before the supreme court before the supreme court uh, the revenue authorities argued that crediting revaluation revaluation amounts to the partner's capital amount uh, capital account is in effect nothing but distribution of assets to the partners of the firm factually it was uh, it was not disputed that the assets of the firm which was the land and building remained with the partnership firm however the revenue took a stand that the crediting of the revaluation account to the partners were uh, in a sense in in effect a dissolution of uh, distribution of the assets so to say of the firm to the to the partners of the firm and as these revalued amounts were credited to the partners capital account and they were available for the partners for withdrawal uh, it was a fit case for applying section 454 uh, the revenue authorities also went to the intention behind introducing section 454 and removing the old section 472 which used to give them exemption and they relied on the an nayak decision also of the bombay high court where it was expressly mentioned that why this partnership law taxability mechanism was revamped from 1987 finance act onwards and uh, in order to curb the practice where it was quite easy for partners to introduce assets and take away the assets on the partnership firm to curb this mischief uh, this this law was introduced so the revenue said that you have done exactly what the legislature wanted you not to do and this transaction would be taxable under 454 because you have used this mechanism to take to to take the balances in the capital account through revaluation to counter argue from the ssc side what the ssc said is that if one way to see section 454 there were in fact two requirements for section 454 one is that there should be a dissolution of the firm and secondly there should be distribution of the assets uh, by the firm to the partner in the present case there was no dissolution of the firm but the but the uh, but the firm continued to carry on their business at the same time there was no distribution of the assets because the balances were only taken from the partners capital uh, capital account and the asset remained with the firm in fact it was also argued by the ssc's counsel that revaluation was only an accounting entry where uh, 
uh, where uh, where the land and building value was debited and the credit was given to the partner's capital account it was not a real income which could be taxed in the hands of the partners or the partnership firm so to say so such notional income in the hands uh, the, it was a, it was since it was a notional entry and an accounting entry the the SSE uh, council argued that it should not be taxable in the hands of the firm and they also said that the reliance of uh, the department on an nike's case was not well placed because in an nike's case uh, what had happened that there was actual distribution of asset which was absent in the present case and the an nike case was in effect arising out of a family settlement scenario where uh, the deed of family settlement and everything was very clear that why the transaction of retirement was happening and how the how the assets were being distributed among the partners so the ssc's council said that in that context the earlier decision of bombay high court had said that even though there was no dissolution but there was a distribution of assets to the partners it was a taxable transaction under 454 but in the present case of mansukh dying since we have not distributed any assets uh, it should not be a fit case for triggering section 454 so these arguments were there uh, before the supreme court by the ssc having heard both the parties uh, what supreme court actually said is that they went by the intention of inserting 454 uh, which we have already discussed that it was there to plug the loophole and it said that the case law which is being relied upon by the ssc which was the hindustan construction case that pertained to the law prior to 1987 where in fact section 454 was not there in the statute book already so this case of hindustan construction relying being relied by the ssc would not help ssc in any manner because this was no not as per the law on which the discussion was happening so having said that supreme court uh, what they what what the supreme court said is that since your credit of assets of capital account can be said that it is a distribution of assets at the fair market value because the balances of the partners got enhanced which was available for them to withdraw on so in effect although it was not a physical distribution it was a kind of a notional distribution but since there was a revaluation followed by a credit to the partners capital account it was considered as a deemed deemed distribution to the partners uh, under the 454 provisions while doing so the supreme court also obviously relied on the uh, decision of the bombay high court which is just spoke about on an nai and the transaction of uh, the transaction of withdrawal by the partnership uh, by the partners was was taxable uh, one point to note here is that while the supreme court said that this transaction would be taxable they did not confine the taxability to the portion which was actually withdrawn by the partners which were somewhere around uh, uh, 20 to 25 lakh or 50 lakh rupees what the supreme court has essentially said is that the entire revaluation which has been done which was the the entire upside of around 17 18 crores uh, of the revaluation of the land and building the entire amount would be would be considered as uh, as a distribution of assets irrespective of the fact that actually it was not withdrawn although it was available for withdrawal because it was lying in the partners capital account so the, the this is the harshness with which the supreme court has come down going by the uh going by the intention of the law when this 454 was introduced uh, and perhaps the facts were very bad in this case where there were too much admission uh, retirement followed by admission and and quick uh, revaluation so that's where supreme court has held that this transaction would be taxable for the first year now for the second year uh, where this transaction was where the partnership firm was converted into a company and the exemption was claimed by the ssc at the same time the the bombay high court in this case had held that because the amount has already been taxed when the partners credit was given the same amount would not be taxed when the partnership firm is converted to the company however this aspect of conversion of partnership firm to the company was actually not discussed by the supreme court so what the supreme court did is that uh, all the discussions happened with respect to the first year of uh, reconstitution and withdrawal and the second year discussion with respect to conversion of the firm to the to the company was not discussed at, at all before the supreme court however when the supreme court passed the judgment it said that the appeal of the department is allowed for both the years 
which incidentally means is that there would be a double taxability in this case where the where, where the first where in the first tax year the transaction would be taxable under 45.4 and in second tax year because the decision has been upheld it's a clear error so to say but uh, the supreme court has said that it would again be taxable uh, in the year of conversion of the firm to the partner uh, to a company disregarding what the high court has said in it in in the underlying judgment so this is what the supreme court has said on this judgment on these specific facts uh, going by the intention of the law and uh, because the facts were quite peculiar uh, instead of uh, acknowledging that there have been no distribution of the capital assets the transaction has been subjected to tax uh, under 454 and also on conversion so if we were to see what uh, what what uh, happens on these uh, the implication of these rulings so all the cases uh, if we were to see where past evaluation has happened and there was an upside given to the partner's capital account even though they would not have been withdrawn those 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 cases would now be prone to being examined by the tax authorities and the decision of this supreme court will will have a very strong persuasive value when these matters are actually pending before appellate authorities i will now move to the next session given the paucity of time uh, if if you now uh, having said that the law which stands today has been completely revamped from 1st of april 2020 uh, because because we now have a modified new avatar of uh, section 454 and there is a altogether new section section 9b which has been introduced uh, uh, in the statute book from 1st of april 2020 20 onwards so uh, there are there, there is a prescribed formula for taxation under 454 the new 454 so to say where any reconstitution is subject to taxability and mind you this new uh, version of section 454 is not applicable in dissolution altogether so the taxability of dissolution now has been shifted from 454 earlier to the new section 9b so what these two section actually says is that whenever if, uh, if if i if i touch upon section 9b it says that whenever there is a reconstitution of a partnership firm and by reconstitution it says that there is a either an admission of the partner or the retirements of partner or even there is a change in profit sharing ratio amongst the partner whenever there is a reconstitution in the partnership firm or a partnership firm is dissolved and in that process any capital asset or a stock in trade is given to the partner so the fair market value of that asset or stock in trade is subjected to tax if it's a capital asset it would be subjected to capital gains if it's a stock in trade which is given to a partner it would be taxable as a normal business income uh, at the same time they have also uh, revamped the section 454 and this is applicable only in case of reconstitution that whenever there is a reconstitution of a firm any cash which is given to the partners or any capital asset which is given to the partners uh, that would be subject to tax in the hands of the firm after reducing the partner's capital balance so if one were to just take a simple example if the partner who was supposed to retire he had a capital balance of 100 rupees in his partner's capital account balance and at the time of retirement uh, the partners agreed to give say 120 to that partner the upside of 20 rupees which happens to be 120 less 100 that 20 rupees is subject to tax under section 454 and this is to be recovered from the partner's account uh, part, uh, partnership firm's account so to say so in a sense 454 is a tax on the partners actually but which is paid by the firm and section 9b is also a tax on the firm but which is obviously to be paid by the firm again interestingly there is an overlap between 9b and 454 where uh, if you can see from this uh, slide that whenever there is a capital asset which is being distributed to the part whenever a capital asset is given to the partner on reconstitution then you will see that both section 9b and 45.4 would apply so so in if if in this uh, the mansuk dying case which we discussed suppose one of the retiring partners instead of withdraw, uh, taking the cash with him he took away the land and building altogether so as per the current law, if we see today, both sections would apply section 9B and 45.4. And what the legislature has done is that to avoid this uh, double taxation, they have said that whatever tax has been paid by the firm under section 9B, that tax would be spread over 
uh, to the remaining assets of the firm so that in future when the remaining assets are sold by the firm they will pay a lesser tax to the extent of tax which was paid earlier when the reconstitution happened and the asset was distributed to the partner so in a sense uh, uh, it's it's a kind of a credit mechanism which they have also inbuilt uh, once a transaction is subjected to both the sections 9b and 45.4 so if 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 i see the if if i see largely there are quite a lot of differences which are there because the whole uh, scheme has been revamped uh, both the the applicability and the trigger of old section 454 was on, was on dissolution or otherwise which we just discussed on the case law however the new section is only towards reconstitution uh, and there is a prescribed formula under the new 454 which which obviously was not required in the old one uh, one interesting thing is that in the new 45.4, there is no concept of any loss because if the amount turns to be zero, suppose uh, in the example which you discussed, out of the 100 capital balance which the partner had in his uh, partner's capital account, if, if he only receives 70 rupees, then that loss benefit is not given to the partnership firm because the way they have uh, prescribed the formula for section 45.4 is that there will be no benefit if, only when there is an upside given to the partner that will be subject to tax. And the computation mechanism is also such that it would not be treated as a capital gain, so to say, where you can offer this, where they can use this income to set off any other loss which you have in your books or maybe invest in some 54 EC related bonds where you can claim exemptions. It is a pure, pure taxing provision, the new section 45.4. Uh, moving, moving, moving ahead, if uh, we were to cover a couple of case studies, uh, Suppose I have just kept this case, the case of Mansuk dying, uh, which was there in the earlier year, what would have happened today if this, this matter was there before uh, under the new of the 45.4. So assuming there are four partners in the partnership firm, everybody is having their 25% share of profit. And uh, Mr. X decides to retire from the firm and he's having a capital balance of say 40 lakh rupees. Prior to him retiring, the land and building is revalued and his account is created by say 1.5 crore rupees being his 25% share of the revalued amount. So his capital balance shoots up from 40 lakh rupees by 1.5 crore rupees and capital balance lands at 1.9 crore rupees. And then it is agreed that he will, he will say uh, leave the partnership firm and withdraw 1 crore rupees from his capital account. Suppose this is the scenario. Now as per the new mechanism 45.4, what the law suggests is that Whatever amount has been taken away by the partner, which in our example happens to be 1 crore, less the capital balance which is there with the partner, which in our example is 1.9 crores. Uh, however, the revaluation effect which was given to the partner's capital account needs to be ignored. So while computing this 45.4 in the new regime, any revaluation done or any self-generated assets created due to which the partner's capital balance is enhanced, that needs to be ignored. So keeping aside that revaluation, uh, once he gets 1 crore rupees less the 40 lakhs initial balance, 60 lakhs will be subject to tax in the hands of the partnership firm under the new law, which seems to be quite logical as well. Suppose just, just tweaking this uh, case study uh, a bit, that instead of getting cash, the partner takes away the land and building uh, with him. Obviously, the what happens here is that both sections, section 45.4 and section 9b would be triggered and uh, the tax under 45.4 would be the same 60 lakh rupees, which we just discussed in case study 1a uh, based on the prescribed formula. Now, coming to section 9b, what will happen is that the firm would compute what is the taxability in the normal case. So, if, so if the tax cost of land and building in the in the hands of the partnership firm was 4 crore rupees and it was fair market valued at 6 crore rupees, the taxability would arise on that 2 crore rupees where the firm would pay tax on 2 crore rupees. Now, since this would be a capital asset for the firm, uh, the, firm, the firm, firm would pay capital gains tax on the 2 crore rupees. Uh, now, what one would see is that on this distribution of capital asset, there are two legs, one 45.4 where 60 lakhs is being paid and another 2 crore is being paid under section 9b on the same transaction of transfer of uh, land and building. So what the legislation has done here is that uh, in our example, so to say the two crore rupees, which is being paid under section 9b, 
this 2 crore rupees would be available as a reduction in the sales consideration if any remaining assets of the firm are sold in future. So suppose there are other, other piece, parcel of land or any other asset which a partnership firm would be selling in future. Whenever those assets are sold, the 2 crore balance would be reduced from the sales consideration of the future sale of the asset so that the ultimate tax impact in future sale of asset is reduced. So this, this could have been a scenario where the old Mansuk dying decision would have been there in today's scenario under the new revamped section 45.4 and section 9b. Uh, so these are the couple of case studies which I just wanted to touch upon now given that we are just close to 4.30. Uh, I think should we take up question and answers if there are any? No, I don't see any question and answers. You can go on for another three minutes if you have a case study or we can uh, then end the session. Do you have any more case study? Yeah, we have one more case study. We can touch upon that. Now, uh, can run this through. Yeah. So suppose uh, in this this case, suppose there were assets were revalued and land and building were revalued and it was not transferred to the capital account of the partners, but were kept in a say, separate account. So in a sense, what, what the 45-4 section suggests is that this, this account, which is credited, the revaluation benefit would not be given. However, when this asset is revalued and this revalued amount is not rated to the capital account and it is kept in a separate identifiable, identifiable account, say a revaluation reserve or something of that, or maybe a current account of the partner, and there is no retirement or dissolution as such, then what could be the taxability in this case? Because there is no credit to the partner's capital account. There is no retirement, there is no dissolution, there is no movement of capital assets also in this case. Now, if one way to really apply the old, uh, the decision of Supreme Court based on the old law, one could say that just because there was a revaluation, there is a, uh, there is a potential liability hanging on uh, the partnership firm to pay tax on this transaction. However, if we go by the new law, which is there, because there is no withdrawal by any of the partners or there is no retirement, this mere credit which would, which would be there to a separate account, ideally this should not trigger any taxability as long as there is no reconstitution or dissolution uh, in the partnership firm. Uh, I, uh, Aditya, I am done with my case studies as well. We okay. can... So there is a one question for you, sir. In a situation where there is a PF reconstitution, uh, with only realignment of profit sharing ratio and no revaluation of assets undertaken, can authorities invoke GAR and revalue the assets? Uh, so, in this case, what I understand is that there is there is a partnership firm reconstitution only by the change in profit sharing ratio. Hmm. And, and as such, there is no withdrawal being done by the partner or there is no distribution of assets being done to the partners and only the... No revaluation as well, no revaluation. And no revaluation as such. Mm. No, the question seems to be, can the authorities revalue the assets as such? Yes. No, so there has been no revaluation by them. Can yeah. the authorities revalue in working GAR? No, but this seems to be, uh, uh, you know, why would the authorities actually do a revaluation when there is no movement to the partner's capital account in any sense, there is only a change in the profit sharing ratio. Mm. Because once the profit sharing ratio is changed, but there is no withdrawal or any distribution. Ultimately, whenever there will be a withdrawal or or or, uh, or distribution of assets, it should ideally get triggered at that point of time. Unless there are more facts to it in the first case where there could be a potential invocation of GAR. Because unless there is a tax benefit derived by the, part, by the partners or the partnership firm, it could not be a case where... A, a GAR scenario would arise. Basandi is writing that uh, there is a new partner admission leading to the change in PSR. Mm, sorry, there is a new partner admission leading to the change in profit sharing ratio. Yes, yeah, so there is a new partner who is. It's not between the existing partners, just because yeah. a new partner is joined. And yeah. then because of by virtue of that, there is a change in PSR. Not between right. the existing partners, and there's no revaluation. Right, but there is no distribution, I guess, uh, which is happening here, or any cash is being paid, or any stock in trade has been paid. 
So as long as none of these events are happening, uh, there is no trigger of section 45.4 or section 9b. Mm. Done. Uh, Sarvani, I think so. There are no more questions and uh, it's already 4.30. So we can now close okay. the session back. We're right on time. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Aditya and the team from Druva Advisors for the lovely session of today. And uh, thank you, delegates who have joined uh, from all over the India to participate in the session. Uh, we look forward to more such sessions uh, on recent Supreme Court cases and recent updates and notifications that we receive from government and also the changes in GST, what that happens, you know, every time, all the compliances. And we look forward to more such sessions uh, with you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So, thank you, audience. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.